Hello, I'm Lee Bernick, and I want to welcome you to another edition of the Urban Report. Uh, today, our first guest to the Urban Report is someone that you, uh, if you've gone to a uh, pep basketball game or a basketball game and seen the pep band, you've seen this gentleman. He's a longtime part of the faculty here at uh, UNLV, uh, Anthony Tony Labani. Uh, and I hear that you've been promoted to being a full professor of music. I want to congratulate oh, you, thank you very for much. that. That's thank a uh, well-deserved honor. Um, well, it, I, do, I do owe it to my colleagues and the students. And the students. Yes. Well, you're really energetic at the basketball games. And, and so you, how about talking about the pep band for a second? And, and we see them the most probably uh, because there are, how many games do you do at the? Well, we do every home game. Uh, men's and women's games. So and like women's games. Lady Rebels games. And, okay. Uh, so well yeah. over 30 games probably yeah. that, you're, yes. that you're there. Yes. And, and how many uh, students are at, in the pep band? Typically uh, we run between 35 and 40. 35 and 40. Yeah. Uh, so they're, and they're pretty loyal about coming in and... and I, would, I would say so, yeah. Yeah. And pretty uh, passionate. Do they do they uh, come back? I mean, I don't know. Do, do we have an alumni group that come we actually, back? Yeah, we actually do. There's a contingent because we, by design, we've opened that band up as a as a community uh, education type course, and we offer it through UNLV Educational Outreach. Okay. So an alum can come back, register at a, a far lesser rate uh, than the per credit rate. And still be a part of the group, which and, is what we want. And, and do, you have, do you have some of the people coming? Absol right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. yeah I would say it's about a third. Of about the a third of the, of the group is, yeah. of the pep band are alumni, are alums of the of the. the. So you, you have these these students and, and alums coming there. Mm -hmm. uh, they play during the game. Um, who uh, I'm always interested. I mean, who selects? Do you, do you select what which which songs you're playing or, or well, what? Well, I, I have. I have a say in it, of course, uh, but a lot of times we'll we'll uh, we'll solicit from the students. You know, what do you what do you want to play? And someone will come in and say, "Hey, this is a hot song," or "Let's try this." Or, uh -huh. um, yeah, and so it's 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 pretty open. It's pretty yeah. open about mm -hmm. that. And, yeah. and but the Viva Las Vegas is one of those that you 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 play almost every. That's just in there. Yeah, it's just <laughs> in there, right? Yeah. Uh, and and so that everybody understands that that's part of our right. Right, but we do we have to pay when when you play that? No, no. We well, actually we do technically because the university has a license that they 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 pay every year to ASCAP and BMI for for use of all, any such music. Okay. Yeah. But but you don't have to worry about. We don't. You, know, no. you don't. You don't no. have to worry about that. And so they're there, um, and they're playing at the at the games. Uh, and they get really excited, really makes a difference. Is, is there a time when you're not allowed to play? I mean, you can't play during the, as the, the play is going on? Yeah, is you, you, uh, but by NCAA rules, you cannot play when the ball is in play. In play. And compounded uh, to that is the aspect of scripting, which is by design by the athletic department. So they basically tell us when we're going to play, when they're going to go to a PA, when they're going to go to... Uh, other acknowledgments, yeah. Okay, and uh, the, the stu do the students have to compete to get into the pep band? I mean, you said they do you not. Have, they no, do they not. do not. They, they, they just, if they want to play, they can come and... Yeah, and they, for any incoming freshman, they have to be, the prerequisite is the university marching band, uh, just so that they can get acclimated to our system and the way we operate. But typically speaking, if it's an alum, Usually, I already know who they are. Okay. They know they know the system. Yeah. All right. Now you mentioned the marching band. Let's talk about that now for a minute. Uh, what's up with the marching band? Tell me a little bit about that and the size and, and how that all works. You were talking about incoming freshmen and. Well, I mean, the size is typically we like to keep it as close as possible to about a hundred members. Uh, and okay. This past year, I think we were at close to that. Um, so we're, we're reaching our objectives for what we can do in terms of resources. So is that 100 members playing instruments, or is that 100 no, members? No, that's, that's 100 members that play instruments plus our 12-member Scarlet Dance Line team. OK. Yeah. All right. And, and do you have to have a certain balance in terms of the people playing? I mean, you have a big drum. Yeah. We, we, we try to keep it a, a good balance. You mentioned drum line. We, we like to have as a big a drum line as possible, but it also puts pressure on uh, the other areas uh, within the department to try to recruit students for those other areas. Okay, so and, you and just put pressure on me too. Okay, you just mentioned another interesting thing. So we recruit students to be part of the band. Yes. 
right? And we're recruiting them from within the valley or outside or anywhere in the country, or how do we know? Anywhere in the world. Okay. Yeah, we have students that are literally coming in from China, Japan. We used to get a lot of students from Japan, um, Mexico, and they would come, South America. They would come to here because of the overall quality of the, of the, the quality music of the, program. the music degree programs, yes. Yeah. Okay, and so most of the people in the band are part of the music program, is that? Is that? I, I would say that's accurate. Obviously there's a contingent of non-music students, engineers, um, hotel majors, criminal okay. justice, etc. Okay, but, yeah. but most of them are part of your band, the marching band, are part of the music department, right? That is, that's, okay. I would say that's accurate. And, and I think you, uh, we were talking before uh, the show started, uh, those same people may be part of other bands or, mm -hmm. or musical, uh, Absolutely. right? Yes. Uh, you not only do the pep band and the marching band, but just shortly, we just have a few seconds, you have other bands that you're Yes, direct? I conduct the UNLV Symphonic Winds, which is a spring ensemble only. You'll see them at commencement this year as an example. Uh, I conduct another group called the UNLV Community Concert Band. It's a, about an 80 member group, comprised of people from all over uh, the Vegas Valley. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they're not just our students. No, there. no. It's that's offered through continuing education. Okay. So you're you're pretty busy and in, in, in doing all these different bands. I mean, how do you? Uh, well, uh, I guess the question is, how do we balance all these out? You, you, in a few seconds, can you tell us how you? Well, I, we balance it out uh, be, because we're all passionate about it, so we can do it, and we know what we're doing, and we have good staff members and good support. But of course, we're always looking for more. Okay. Well, we're going to have to uh, end this. Uh, I appreciate you coming, and we're going to have to get the band members all out okay. here too, Let's and, do and it. have them come in and, and uh, give us a little pep band. Uh, we'd, we'd be pleased to do that. Okay. Well, that's great. Well, thank you for coming in, and again, congratulations for your promotion to full professor. Well, well it's deserved. My, it's honor. my pleasure, and thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take a break now. For others, it may have just been a summer job. But for me, it was training. Now I'm an Air Force pararescue man, and my job is to save lives. Make the right choices today, and be ready for the challenges tomorrow. This message is brought to you by the U.S. Air Force. found every hazard out here today? Think again. The spot you missed could be a killer. That spot on your skin could be skin cancer. Fact is, if you're a man over 50, you're in a group most likely to develop skin cancer, including melanoma, the kind that kills one person every hour. One in five Americans is likely to develop a form of skin cancer during their lifetime. That's why your best shot is to check for a spot. It's easy. Follow through and check your skin. It could be the save of a lifetime. Go to spotskincancer.org to find out how. A message from the American Academy of Dermatology. Winston! Just one more inning, Grandma! Ever notice how many things today kids can do without actually moving? A whole lot of things their parents used to do the hard way. So many kids' activities today seem to leave out the activity part, which makes exercise even more important for children. In fact, new research tells us the best time to enhance bone development is during childhood and adolescence. And just getting children to walk an extra 35 minutes a day could spare them the pain of thinning bones later in life. Healthy bones come from healthy habits. Encourage your kids to get up, get out, and get moving. Hello. Hey, Grandma, how about another grape soda? A public service message on building strong bones for kids from the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America and the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Hello, I want to welcome you back to this edition of the Urban Report. 
And in this segment, I'm honored to have uh, a uh, Deputy Chief Mark Josephs from the uh, Metropolitan Police Department from Metro. Metro. And uh, Mark, uh, how long have you been with the force and with Metro? Uh, just a little over 25 years. Okay, and you started out in Metro? Well, I was 23 when I went to the academy and uh, time has flown by very quickly okay. now, 25 years later. 25 years later, and you're responsible for? Right now, uh, uh, helicopters, canines, motorcycles, uh, event planning, Laughlin, uh, a whole series of teams. things. Yeah, okay, a, a whole bit. series Absolutely. of things. But I think what we wanted to talk about today uh, is something that we hear on the news all the time, mm -hmm. and that's uh, traffic issues, safety issues, and the two together, right? I mean, we have both traffic problems, we do. but we have safety issues related to that traffic. Uh, you know, absolutely. And first of all, thank you for letting me be here with you to, to talk about traffic issues. And, you know, just to really start out, um, we had 109 fatalities on our road last year. That's uh, 37 more than we had in, in 2011. And so far this year, just in Metro's jurisdiction alone, We've had 16, two more than we had this time last year. And, uh, you know, it's a problem for us in our community. Uh, that's not to even take into consideration the, 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 the people that are even clinging to life or, or the injuries that happen. And traffic accidents are embarrassing at a minimum. Uh, they can be costly. They can result in injury and sometimes cause death. And, and what is it that you think, is it simply the fact that there are just more cars, more people, in terms of the, the spike, if you will, or the increase in traffic? I mean, how do you go from in your 60s into the hundreds in, in traffic deaths? What, what well, is that? That's a, that's a, a great question, and uh, I don't know if there's any one particular thing that we can, we can point to. Um, you know, if you read articles, some people say, well, you have nice weather, more people out walking around. Uh, increase in population means more cars. Uh, and, you know, you drive the, the streets as, as well as everybody else here, and uh, the reality is um, it's a metal tube uh, with glass around it and rubber tires, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we see a lot of cars go by us throughout the day, and there, there's nothing wrong. Everybody does it pretty well. Um, but uh, the inattention to driving, uh, distracted driving, aggressive driving is really a problem for us in our community. And uh, there is no one specific answer. Uh, you can look at it from an engineering standpoint. Uh, we can look at you know, how you design the streets and street lights and flow of traffic. Uh, you, certainly education plays a big point. And I think education really can make a difference. And we can talk about that. We've got to do better, better with education. Uh, there's only so many police officers out there that can enforce the rules of the road. Uh, you have emergency personnel, and I'm talking really about five E's here, and the last one is everyone. It's everybody's, uh, everybody's problem. Everybody needs to pitch in to, to try to make a difference. And, you know, uh, you know, people are always in a hurry sometimes. They don't leave themselves, uh, you know, a little bit of a margin to go from point A to point B. So, um, you know, it can be very frustrating. So let me, let me ask you, you mentioned a couple things. You mentioned distracted driving, uh -huh. and, of course, the big one for us, I think, right now is the whole thing about texting, mm -hmm. right, and... and, and uh, can we really get a grip on that? I mean, you know, and, and who does the most texting? you have any sense of that? Is it, is it just young people or, or, or what? I mean, it, isn't that one of the issues is, is texting and, and maybe phone? I mean, we have a law that prohibits us from being on it. And, and what happens? Well, it is a big issue. And, uh, you know, could I, certainly the younger generation is really in, you know, they can't wait for the next text to come in. And that's really how they communicate. Uh, but, but, you know, you see, every day you, you see younger people, uh, older folks, middle-aged folks uh, really using that cell phone. And uh, most people drive with one hand anyway, but when you're talking to somebody or you just have to get that text or that email, it's taking your, diverting your attention from the roadway, what you really need to be paying attention to. Uh, it's against the law to have a, a cell phone in your hands. It's against the law to talk on it while it's in your hands. It's against the law to text or, or email while it's in your hand. Uh, the reality is... Uh, you know, there's just not enough police officers every day out there to catch every single person that comes Do, out of track. Does, does Metro actually try to look for people? I mean, or is it just a secondary part? I mean, if you're looking for someone speeding or braking, going through a red light or something, you know, that's pretty clear. Is it the case, though, that we, that 
officers are out driving around and they and they just happen to catch, or are they looking for the people who are texting? Does that make sense? What I'm asking. Well, uh, it does. It does make sense, and, and it's a great question. It's a little bit of both. Uh, we have enforcement days where we'll specifically be out there looking for those types of violations, and we've written thousands of tickets. I mean, literally thousands of tickets. Um, and the fines start out for your first offense uh, within a seven-year period. It's fifty dollars and a hundred dollars, and it goes up to I think one hundred and fifty dollars for the third offense. Um, the, the reality is, uh, you know, we've got to trust people to do the right thing, and we can't be there all the time to to enforce those violations. So I just have one quick. We we have to take a break, and then we'll come back and talk okay. some more. But let me ask you one quick question. So they get a fine fifty dollars. Is there anything in terms of points? Do you get points? Is that so there's yeah. no, there's, it's just a monetary cost, but not in a, a point cost and an insurance cost. Yeah. Is that right? We, we kind of eased into it. To answer your question briefly, uh, we, we, we probably do need to get to some stiffer penalties for it, but really it's about the education. We need to get people to understand the dangers of, of texting and talking on your cell phone and not having your free hands free and your attention straight on the road. Okay. Uh, let's take a short break here and then I want to come back and talk some more about traffic and you, you didn't mention one thing that I want to ask you about and that's uh, alcohol and we'll come back okay. to that and then and we'll take a short break. Great. Thank you. Thank you. If you could see anything in the world, what would it be? I'd love to see Paris. falling from the sky. My daughter, married and happy. I want to see things the way I used to. Chances are, someone you love may one day be affected by macular degeneration or glaucoma. Log on to seeabettertomorrow.org or call 1-800-437-2423 to learn about glaucoma and macular degeneration. Call 1-800-437-2423 or log on to seeabettertomorrow.org. I just want to see more of the things I love. I remember the moment. I'll never forget that moment. That moment? It was a moment that changed my life. I'd been training with my team for months. And now, we had been called up for the first time. The real deal. Wildfires were getting dangerously close to homes. At that moment, I got my first taste of just how important the Guard is to my community. See how the Guard can be an important part of your life at NationalGuard.com. At what age is the color that your skin was meant to be no longer beautiful? Every year, millions of young women try to change the skin they were born with and say they die for darker skin. Sadly, some actually do. Melanoma is the second most common cancer in teens and young adults, and one person dies from melanoma every hour. Change your thinking, not your skin. Stop tanning. Learn more at SpotSkinCancer.org. A message from the American Academy of Dermatology. Something's not right. My first symptoms were... Constant tingling in my toes. My legs, sometimes I'll go numb. I had double vision. They said you have multiple sclerosis. Well, the beginning is the hardest time. Kind of had to get a grasp on reality. I had to adapt and change very rapidly. I had to learn how to drive with my hands. Yeah, that was interesting. I was a dancer. I don't see walking the way I walk any different than doing a dance. It just looks different. It's a different dance. You see me have an off day, it doesn't take away from who I am. A symptom may cause you not to be able to do that anymore. And at one point, I wasn't able to do any of those. But I would exercise every day. Since I've been cycling, it's definitely helped my walking. To make a lot of changes in my life and just adapt to it. I'm going to acknowledge its presence. I'm not going to discount it. But at the same time, I'm going to try my best to not let it stop me. It's a fantastic opportunity to be working together with a common goal of carrying MS. And sharing is the key. I want to welcome you back to uh, this another segment of the uh, Urban Report, and we're here again with uh, Deputy Chief Mark Josephs, and we've been talking about traffic and about uh, traffic accidents and, and unfortunately traffic deaths. And we talked about the inattention in terms of people using uh, cell phones, um, but then you mentioned um, also uh, aggressive driving yeah. and. Um, is there something, when we talk about aggressive driving, what do you mean by aggressive driving? 
Is well, it just uh, the weaving in and out or, uh, or what? Well, it's that, uh, inclusive of that certainly, uh, but the, you know, over the speed limit, um, you're really just in a hurry trying to get from point A to point B and not realizing that in a split second, the blink of an eye, uh, a person or family's life, multiple families, uh, can change in a moment. Uh, people just have to understand that, you know, if, if they don't slow down, uh, bad things can happen. And that's really what we, we, you know, that's why we enforce the speed limits. We, we know that at high speeds, we get injuries and, and sometimes deaths. So it, it, when, when we say aggressive, are we just talking about speeding or are we talking about weaving in and out? Or? Uh, weaving in and out, following too closely, um, you know, uh, the, the speeds. It, it's, really, it's really all of that. Okay. And do we have a, when we give out tickets, I mean, are we talking about people from here or, or is there another, how, how many of the tickets and how many of the issues are people who are coming in and you know, are coming into Vegas and they're, and they're here to have a good time and they lose sort of a, a focus or common sense about how they ought to behave because yeah. they're here to have a good time. Well, I mean, really at any one time, the majority of people here in our community are the people that reside here, but we have, you know, probably close to 40 million visitors a year. Uh, many fly in, utilize the public transportation systems, but then we have, you know, bordering states where people drive into. Uh, between us and the Nevada Highway Patrol, uh, we often work the freeways uh, that are going, in, you know, in and out of our valley here, and they often catch people uh, at a high rate of speed, weaving in and out of traffic, either trying to come to Las Vegas, you know, to have a good time, or trying to get back home because they're in a hurry. And uh, again, in a blink of an eye, uh, can really make a difference for okay. a lot of people. And, and in that blink of an eye, let, let me. Uh, sometimes the blink, uh, or it can be more dangerous because people are drinking and driving. What, what's the story in, you know, for us here in, in Las Vegas in terms of drinking and sure. driving? Well, uh, we're a 24-hour town. Um, you know, alcohol is very prevalent. Uh, but that doesn't mean that everybody drinks, gets behind the wheel of a car. You really make a conscious effort to get behind the wheel of a car and drive. Uh, is it a problem for us? Yes, it is. Our DUI arrests are up this year over, over last year and even the year before. Um, we often do DUI checkpoints. Uh, there's a cost associated with that, and there, you know, there's a limit to the number of them because they're very manpower intensive, but we do those checkpoints uh, throughout the year, and uh, we do our best to uh, remove the people from the road who are driving under the influence of some kind of substance. So there are two, there are two questions I want to get to, but let's talk about these checkpoints. Um, do they really, I mean, we announce, where, sometimes you announce where the checkpoints are going to be, yeah, right? I we mean, do. And, and does that make a difference when you announce versus when you don't announce where the checkpoints are? Or, well, or how does uh, that all work? That's a great question. Our hope is that uh, if we announce it, I mean, we're going to be there anyway. If we announce it, we hope to deter people from drinking and driving, and we find it to be a benefit. Hopefully that people realize that, you know, I have to go that way if I'm going out or going home. I'm going to think twice about getting behind the wheel of a car if I've had too much to drink. Uh, and the checkpoints, they, they do make a difference. But there's a limited amount of people that come through that area, and uh, you, know, you can only do them on a limited basis. It, it just, they're very manpower intensive. Okay. Uh, I think we had some information about, um, well, let me, let me do one more thing about this, okay. uh, the checkpoints. So we announced the checkpoints, you stop them, uh, they have to take the sobriety tests, and, 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 and right, I mean, and all these kinds of, is that right? I mean, uh, if the officer feels that they're under the influence, they'll t put them through a series of, of tests. Okay. And um, uh, the question for me is, do we have higher levels of alcohol? I mean, I, I, I saw some statistic where our, the people who are arrested, that we arrest, tend to have a higher level than, you know, like the, the level right now is 0.08, right? If you, Correct. You know, but we, ours might be at 0.15. I don't know the exact number. I mean, are, do we? You mean the, 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 the alcohol blood content, alcohol, the people? Blood alcohol well, uh, you know, we get some that are very close and we get some that are outrageously over the, the legal limit. Uh, in, in any event, uh, if you're over, you're over. And honestly, even if you're near that amount, uh, it can be very dangerous. It, it, it takes away from your ability to steer that car properly. Right. Well, that's that blink of the eye and attention. The, the alcohol makes a difference in that kind alcohol of... Alcohol makes a difference, absolutely. Alcohol makes a difference. Uh, I think there was some information that we were going to talk about. Um, actually, 
I want to get to another part, and I know that there's some information we want to put up, but I, I really want to talk about this question of pedestrian safety. Sure. Okay? Because you hear that all the time, and, and you know, you're walking down the street and you wonder, now wait a minute, why is this happening? We, we actually have accidents right in front of our building here where we go across from Maryland Parkway and we have a place where people are supposed to stop to let us cross. Is it a driver issue? Is it a pedestrian issue? What's the combination of those two things no, that cause us to have these real problems? Well, Dean, that's a great question. It's both. Uh, drivers uh, have to watch where they're driving. Pedestrians have to watch where they're walking. Um, and, you know, the, the front of the Maryland Parkway area has really been redesigned pretty significantly over the year to bring greater attention to the students that are coming in, the faculty that are coming and going across the street. But it really, it really takes two, and the best thing you can do is make eye contact with that driver and, and do your best to make sure that you see them and they see you. And, and uh, so in your sense of this, is, is the fact that we have the pedestrian uh, death is that there isn't this eye contact, that the, the driver is inattentive, or that the pedestrian is just not paying attention where they're going. I mean, you know, you talk about being both, but, you know, um, my sense is that sometimes it's the pedestrian who hasn't paid attention and they're not going in crosswalks or something. What, what do we... Well, uh, you know, again, it, it really is a contributing factor for both people. I mean, if a pedestrian walks into the street and the driver is paying attention, there are opportunities to avoid that collision. If the driver isn't paying attention and the pedestrian isn't paying attention, we're going to end up with some, some tragedy there. And people have a, a false sense of crosswalks being some barrier or protection. Right. Okay, they're there, uh, but simply they're, they're markings on the ground. They're not going to stop somebody for, who runs through a red light, uh, who maybe, uh, you know, steps into the street when they shouldn't have. And, and pedestrians are, are, are challenged for us. Okay, let me ask you, just to follow up on that, um, would a driver get a ticket for not stopping when the person is trying to start across the street in, uh, in those crosswalks? Well, you know, it all, it, it depends on the circumstances and each circumstance is unique. So you really have to look at, you know, the color of the lights, uh, you know, who had the, the right of way. Sometimes it's, it's both at fault uh, or, or, or either one intoxicated. There's just really a lot of factors that go into that. And that's what our traffic officers go out there and try to reenact what happened. Okay. And uh, again, uh, we want to talk about safety. I, I think I'm going to have to have you come back because there's so many more things to talk about sure. in terms of the safety issues. Glad to do it. And, and all the kinds of problems that we have uh, in this. I, I want to thank you for coming to uh, the campus and to talk about these issues. And I want to thank the community for watching uh, the Urban Report. Uh, we're here to help serve the community and having people like Deputy Chief uh, Joseph here to talk about safety is an important part of uh, our trying to get the message across. And so I want to thank you. Um, if you have questions or concerns, you can always contact us at the uh, Dean's Office at the Greensman College of Urban Affairs. Uh, we're glad that you're watching the Urban Report.